80% of trades now are machine to machine, yeah. and the human is, is being left behind. Value doesn't die. Yeah. It goes out of favor, it goes into hibernation, I guess. Germany's on the teetering, teetering on the Italy's edge of recession, in, in Italy recession, in recession. Yep. And we don't need to be in a deep, dark depression. All we need is a little recession. Well, that's the trouble. That's the trouble, yeah. right? I think the dollar is in secular decline. I think we are in a race to the bottom with the yen and the euro. And I think all developed markets uh, have no choice. Am I glad to see you? Oh, <laughs> it's my favorite time of the year when I get to come see you. It, it seems like forever since you and I got the chance to sit down and chat. I know. I know. So, much has, so much has gone on. And you know, whenever you and I sit and talk, we go off in all kinds of different directions. I, I never know where these conversations are going to go, but they're always good fun. But what, what I really want to talk to you about today is not crypto. Awesome. We're going we're gonna to give you a chance to take a break from <sighs> crypto, because I know that you nice. talk about that a lot lately. Yeah. Um, if we have some time, maybe we'll get back maybe. to it. But I don't yeah. think you and I are going to have time, because yeah. we're going to get wrapped up. So. I want to talk to you about the investment industry, yeah, because it's something that obviously you've got a lot of experience in, and it's changing seemingly every, every day. day. Every day. So, you know, I thought we could just kind of go through, take a look at the state of the industry, get your current thoughts on mm -hmm. the players, the yeah. strategies, what's working, what's not working, and just try and pick through that and see if we can come up with anything interesting. Because when I've thought about it, there's yeah. so much changing, and, and I thought. I've got well, and the going speed down. of the change yeah, exactly is accelerating. Right. Exactly that's, right. that's the real problem. Yeah, I mean, or, or well, challenge. You're a perfect example, right? With, yeah. the, with the with the move into a lot of this crypto stuff. Yep. So you know, when you talk to a lot of these guys and you talk to more than most, what what trends are you starting to see shift in, in amongst the investors and amongst the allocators? Well, yeah, look, I mean, one of the reasons I'm down here in Cayman is is this conference, and it's about tectonic shifts, and that. You know, integration of, of technology and AI and machine learning and, and all these things that are impacting our business. And, and you think about it, I think, I think the stat they threw around this morning was 80% of trades now are machine to machine. Yeah. And the human is, is being left behind. And you got the passive boom, that's changing the landscape. And active management's dead. I mean, let's go through the things that have died. Active management's yep. dead. Hedge funds are dead. Yep. You know, Big great managers from you know years past are, are all washed up and you know they have no yep. role and it's all about the the quant jockeys and value you know, forget value forget oh value's dead yes yeah, value's yeah. dead yeah so we, we need a bigger tombstone right. for all the stuff <laughs> that's or a bigger graveyard yeah for all the stuff that's dead well let, let, let's uh, let's talk about value you and I value guys and and, and this is something that we've yeah. had in common for the longest time and this is something that. I mean, it's so ridiculous to me that something called value could essentially be off everybody's radar screen. I mean, value is value. Look, it, it, it is the best strategy over long periods of time. It always has been. It, it has to be, right? Yeah. If you buy something below its intrinsic value, it will eventually accrete back to fair value and probably go above fair value. So that's a good strategy. Buying something that's more expensive than fair value and hoping that it gets more, more right. expensive, it can work over short periods of time, but over long periods of time, values can win. The problem is when you have periods of excess liquidity, it favors growth and momentum, yep. and it favors passive. Now, I get you know, really edgy or itchy when you start talking about this passive thing, because there's no such thing as passive, right? There's only slow active. Right. <laughs> passive is a myth, right? It's, it's like smart beta. <laughs> it's an oxymoron, you know, it can't be, beta is dumb, yep. being rule-based. And the problem with passive is it's rule-based, right? It, it follows rules and it can't think. And so if you have a company with no growth, but it's in the buy list and someone puts money in that ETF, it Boom. must buy that. No matter what PE it is, it go to 25, go to 30, go to 40. And so what happens is, in periods of excess liquidity, that liquidity goes into these passive strategies. They have this reflexive, self-perpetuating, mm -hmm. virtuous cycle, which pumps up prices. But then as we saw in the fourth quarter last year, once it reverses, that reflexivity goes the other way. Now, again, they can't think. They just sell and people withdraw money. They must sell more. And so now it turns vicious. And so I think that's where we are today. And people are going to wake up the same way they did back in 2000. Go back to 2000, okay? Seth Klarman, not even arguable whether he's one of the best investors right, of right. all time. 
in 2000 was a bum, didn't know what he was doing, no one would give him any money, value was dead, active yep. management was dead, hedge funds were evil, why would anyone give him money? He'd underperformed the S&P 500 for the last 10 years. And then for the next 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, what happened? The S&P compounded at minus 1.9% per year for 10 years, and he compounded 17 and a half. <laughs> exactly. Because value doesn't die. Yeah. It goes out of favor, goes into hibernation, I guess. It's not even hibernation because it's well, exactly. not what doing it? it, right? What is it, it's, right? It's, exactly. It's, it's perception. Look, our business has evolved over time to be more uh, media facing, more, you know, there's television advertising. You know, in the old days, right, there's no way you would advertise other than maybe, you know, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen or yeah, so, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And, but there wasn't this constant drone of advertising and trying to gather assets. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a business of, of the business. It was, we take care of your money, we're stewards of your capital, we're fiduciaries. Now it's about gathering your assets and, and yeah. taking a piece before you take them back from us. And I think that has led us to this point where uh, companies have built brands that attract capital with this, I, I won't lose it, and I won't underperform this random benchmark that we all look at, the S&P 500, but if I underperform the, the strategy of value, which is to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're dear, over long periods of time, you're not gonna care because you're only looking at the short-term window of performance. Yeah. And you know, you and I talked a little bit about this over dinner, is one of the big problems to me is we've gone from a, a culture of ownership to rentership. Yep, for you sure. Know, we used to own companies. We used to buy things and hold them for a decade. I think the average holding period in the 60s was 11 years. Now it's seven months, something like that. That's crazy. And you can't be the owner of a business. You can't be the beneficiary of strategy and long-term thinking if you hold, hold something for seven months. No, no. You can't. But the, you know, this whole idea of value, it, it's, when you think about what investors are supposed to do, like yeah. who doesn't want to buy someone that's value, right? If, 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 I think if you asked anybody, they would say, yes, of course that makes yeah, sense. Of course, right? But, but to your point, you know, about Seth and, and his performance back in, in, in that period, yeah. and here we are again 10 years later, everything you said there was today. The only thing you didn't mention was the tech bubble, which we had in 2000 as well, yeah. right? The setup's exactly the same. No, we're in tech bubble 2.0. Right. I think it broke last September. I think we're going to go through exactly what happened from 2000, 2001, 2002. In fact, I call it hashtag 2000 yeah. redo on Twitter. And, and I think we're there. The one thing that is true, though, is as much as I pick on the growth mindset of, of investing and, and that you can buy these stocks at any price, I've never met a growth manager who says they overpay. Right. And I've yes. never met a value manager who says they don't buy things that are not growing. Yeah. So this element of kind of crossover is, is definitely there. But fundamentally, the difference to me is if you're willing to buy something simply because the price is rising and don't look at the value of the business, then you're not an investor, you're a speculator. Sure, yeah, absolutely right? quite right. If you buy something after you've evaluated the fundamental intrinsic value of a business and you buy with a margin of safety, back to Seth's book mm -hmm. and, and you know, Ben Graham and all those principles that we all believe in, that's being an investor. And I'm not saying speculators are evil, there's a role for speculation. But short sellers are evil. We all know it. Short, oh, well, short sellers, sellers are, are evil, definitely obviously. evil. I mean, come on. <laughs> Why? What's good about exposing frauds? What's good about bringing overvalued securities back to fair value by exposing accounting irregularities or, or malfeasance? I mean, how could that possibly be good know, for society? Right them I mean, off. Jeez. I mean, those guys like, you know, Mark Cahodes. I mean, right. What, what, yeah. Geez. Who needs that guy? Well, look, let, let's talk about, you mentioned there, uh, you thought the tech bubble may have burst back in yeah. September, October. Let, let's talk about that because you know, what we saw at the tail end of last year, when you dig into it, was actually a lot bigger than I think people yeah. believe and a lot more important than the rebound since has got people thinking. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of few. We, we dodged a bullet there. Absolutely. But under the hood, things got really bad back at the end of last year. Really bad. Really, really bad. And, and, and they're bad for a reason. 
And it's because we've had a series of policy errors. We've had a series of just cyclical developments that, that is natural. And for too long, because of QE, right, this QE era, it, it overstayed its welcome. Right? Yeah. There was a role for QE at the depths of the crisis. Right? You know, somebody who worked for Bernanke told me that you know, he came into the room and he said, I've looked into the abyss and we're not going there, guys. Right? Because Did he then rip up this shirt to no, expose because, it? No, because, again, he's a very calm, rational, reasoned, thoughtful guy. And what he was saying was, you know how fractional reserve banking works. And you know what a levered financial system looks like. Mm -hmm. A run on that bank, we're not having that. We saw that in 1907, the Knickerbocker panic. We're not going to have that again. So buying these bonds in the short term, that makes sense. right? Saving the patient makes sense. But we overstayed the welcome, and I believe it's because we got into this mentality that we have all these boomers. You know, I'm one of them. I'm one of the last years of the baby boom. And we're all going to retire. And it happens every single day in this country, in the United States. 10,000 people turn 65 yeah. every single day for the next 17 years. And those people don't have enough money to retire. So you've got to, where's their capital? Well, it's in 401k plans and in the stock market. And so we've got to get those values up. And so we've had this third rail of policy that used to be about jobs and inflation. Yep. And now there's this third rail. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't care about the market. Well, yes, they do. Because every time the market has even gone down a little bit, the Fed has changed their tune. They've either increased liquidity or there's been the Shanghai Accord with mm -hmm. China for them to inject liquidity. And every time we've had a drop, we've had a V bottom. But the problem is, and I talked about this um, right around the, the Christmas time period, when we, 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 to your point, it was really bad. Yeah. I mean, it was really dark on the 24th. I mean, stuff was starting to unwind and unravel, and there was really a lot of tension. And they called together the group, right? You know, the working group on uh, economic stability yep. or a plunge protection team, whatever you want to call them. And they said, guys, we, we can't go there again. And what they do? So they inject a little capital and, you know, got some buying and we get a short squeeze and we get this nice V-shaped bottom. And so now it's, whew, it's all good. No, it's not. Because I use the analogy of a rubber ball bouncing down a set of stairs, right? Each bounce is higher. That's just kinetic energy. Yeah. But the end of the trip is a bad place. And we're at the point where there was a time where by the dip or by the something dip yeah. was a good thing. Yeah. But now it's sell the rip. So we should be selling into each of these rips in the overvalued markets. I think there are plenty of undervalued markets around the world. But in the overvalued markets, which are the developed world, Europe and the U.S. and Japan, we should be lightening up on these risk assets, particularly the indices. And so I think people are, are um, fooling themselves if, if they think that it's all good. And I call it the cupboard is bare market. Mm -hmm. right? Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. When she got there, the cupboard was bare. Right. And the poor dog's gonna get none. And I think that's where we are. And I think that's gonna be a very uh, unpleasant outcome for a lot of people that are so dependent on this singular exposure. And, and they've been conditioned that way really since the 80s, that stocks should be the core of your portfolio and big cap US stocks should be the core of your portfolio. And I, I just don't understand that. I mean, to me, particularly for, for people who have a long time horizon. You know, for all the young people today, they shouldn't own a lot of stock. They should own private businesses and they should own innovation sure. and venture capital and real assets and the things that will take advantage of the greatest source of alpha on the planet today is time arbitrage. So let's talk about the outcome. You mentioned the outcome there, and this is what interests me because I agree we can see where this is going, yeah. right? And we can see how it wants to go there, yep. which is quickly. And we can see how desperately they, financial protection team, fair, Whoever whatever, is, yeah. don't want it to happen. How do we end up getting there? Because I think we have to get there. Yeah, um, we do. And, and we do and we will. And, and I said, the reason I think this is just like 2000, 2001, 2002, is think about what was created in that period. 
right? We had this big injection of liquidity because of Y2K. Yep. Yeah, we we're all afraid of Y2K. Can you and we pumped half a trillion. Yep. Back when half a trillion was a lot of money, you know, people forget that a trillion is a dollar every second for 31,710 years. Yep. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. So half a trillion pumped in and it went into small cap stocks, tech stocks, and we created a bubble. And we created the greatest bubble of all time because it got so narrow and we had four stocks that you could not lose. Yep. Right? If you bought Cisco, Intel, Microsoft, and Qualcomm, you could not lose money. No sell ratings on these stocks. Everybody said to buy them. Okay, Cisco was selling at 286 times earnings. Right, right, right. It's crazy. Think about that. Paying 286 for one dollar, you have to live something like a hundred and something years to make a 10% return. But it was crazy back then too. This is not. But no one thought deal. it was crazy. No one thought it was crazy. Everybody bought Cisco at seventy dollars. Everybody. And today it's like 35. Mm -hmm. 18 years later. In fact, that basket of four stocks is. Underwater. Yeah. Microsoft is up a lot because of Azure and stuff, but it's crazy. And then what happened is you had a bunch of companies that took advantage of the cheap interest rates in 2001 when we had the recession. So we had the recession in 01. It was exacerbated by 9 11. Yep. Okay. That, that was an a unknown unknown that really did make things worse. So they cut interest rates a lot and then people loaded up on debt. We had WorldCom and Enron and all these guys. In 2002, what happened? The debt bubble blew up. And so 2000 wasn't the bad year. It was only down 9%. 2001, not even that bad a year. It was only down 12%. It was 2002, down 22%. Yeah. It was bad. Now it was 48, 49% peak to trough. And here we are. What happened in 2001? January, market was up about 5.5%. Mm -hmm. Why? Everything was fixed. Yep. Tech bubble was fine. Everything was going to go back up. It was a return to normal. And then down 30 because the recession hit in the first quarter. Now, we didn't know it was a recession, because remember, recession always gets called later. After the fact, yeah. In fact, I think it's a great stat. I think 80-something percent of recessions aren't recognized until April of the year in which they occur, yeah. <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> and so I think that one got named in September. So negative GDP first quarter, positive second quarter, negative third quarter, 1% growth for the whole year, not negative, but enough of a recession to trigger earnings to fall, then 9-11 exacerbates it, and then we have the debt crisis. And I think the same thing's happening now. If you look at every piece of economic data, it's fallen off a cliff. Yep. You look at earnings, falling off a cliff. I, I showed this one chart in my Around the World last week on my 10 surprises. Tech earnings expectations literally made a 90 degree turn and have fallen an unbelievable amount in the last two months. And it's because people are realizing that things are not as good as, as they appear. Yeah. ECB just cut European growth rates. Yep. Germany's on the teetering, teetering on the Italy's edge of recession. In, in Italy recession, in recession. Yep. And look, we don't need to be in a deep, dark depression. All we need is a little recession. Well, that's the trouble. That's the trouble, yeah. right? It doesn't, you're right. It doesn't, everyone's talking about the end of the world. We don't because need that. Because we all are victim, not victims. We're all a product of the environment in which we grew into the business. Yeah. The bulk of the people so in the true. investment business today, what, what's their most recent memory? Sure. The global financial crisis. And so they think that's a normal downdraft. No, normal downdraft is 2000. Normal downdraft is 1994. Normal downdraft is 1983, mm -hmm. right? When I was living in Seattle and they said, you know, last person to leave, please turn out the lights. Right. You know, Seattle's a pretty cool place now. Yep. Amazon likes it. Um, so I, I think we're at this point where we have this last gas rally here in January, and now people are gonna to have to wake up and say, wait a minute, earnings aren't that great. Growth isn't that great. Valuations maybe are too high. And look, I don't know that we have to go down 30, but I think by the end of this year, we're gonna be down high single digits, low teens, and that's gonna be a wake up call to people. And then it's next year in 2020 that I actually get really nervous. Well, yeah, let's talk about that because I'm curious as to what you think the reaction will be. Let's say we do end up, let's call it 10% down this yep. year. Yep. How do people react? Because that's, that's not a good look. And to your point, there are people in this industry that would have no clue what that's like. Yes. Down, you know, a couple of years down. Yeah. What, you know, what happens? What do people do? Do they overreact? Well, QE4. Well, well, individuals will overreact. They already, look at December right. had... I think I'm right on this. All-time record outflows from mutual yeah. funds. Yep. I think it was all-time record. 
people freaked because you know we were down 19.8 in the S and P and over 20 in Nasdaq, and people freaked. Which is and ridiculous, but it is ridiculous. It's especially ridiculous because time horizons are just too short for everybody. Even a 55 year old guy like me, you know, God willing, I got a long time, and. That means I shouldn't be investing for five years or 10 years. I shouldn't have this big bond waiting. I should have more innovation in my portfolio, more real assets. If you're in your 30s, you should have zero. I would argue it should be actually against the law to own bonds <laughs> right. if you're under 50 yeah. in, your, in your retirement account, right? And so since most of these ETFs and mutual funds are held in retirement accounts, panicking doesn't make any sense. Now, I can argue that preparing in advance, right, rebalancing back to a more balanced portfolio. The problem is if you started eight years ago with a balanced portfolio, right, 60, 40, you've got a way big overweight in equities. Yeah, huge. And you should have been rebalancing yeah. back to bonds. And you know, a year ago in my 10 surprises, I said the biggest surprise of all would be that bonds beat stocks for the year. And literally people were laughing at yeah. me like, oh, you, you literally have lost it. I mean, this crypto stuff is bad, but that you lost <laughs> it. Right. And through October, Oh, see, you're just an idiot, right? Well, bonds actually be stocks. Yeah. And people are like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah, it did. And that wasn't huge, and it wasn't you know, a rousing victory, but it was a victory. And I think the same thing's going to happen this year is people forget, you know, January last year, big return. Mm -hmm. Bonds went down. By April, the gap had closed, but then stocks took off. Bonds were kind of meandering down. And by September, the alligator jaws were really wide. Yep. And I'm sure you, you know, I think we have maybe even talked about this, is alligator jaws always close. Always. Always. And so the wider they get, the more dangerous they are. And I think that's, that's where we are today. And one thing I know with, with pretty good certainty is that people who are 65 to 85 have a preference for fixed income securities over equities, right? They just do. And we're going to have a whole bunch more of those people. Yep. And I think Raoul's been writing a lot about this in that we're going to go from a trillion a year of inflows into the system to a trillion a year of outflows mm -hmm. from the system as people start to retire and have to take withdrawals yeah. when they turn have 71 to. and a half. To. They have yeah. to. There's no choice. And I just think, look, liquidity drives markets. And I don't know if you've ever done uh, something with the cross-border guys, but I love those guys. Yeah, and, really good. I mean, they're, they're awesome. And, and liquidity drives markets. And liquidity is falling off a cliff globally. I mean, falling off a cliff. Which is hard to even believe, right? I mean, okay, I take know. QT out of the system, but I the know. ECB is still in there, PBOC is still in there. I know. How is liquidity? You can see how it might be easing, but falling off a cliff seems counterintuitive. I, I know. It does seem counterintuitive. But I think it, has, it must have to do with the fact that Emerging markets are a bigger component, mm -hmm. and they were all forced to tighten when the Fed raised yep. rates. And so they were all forced to tighten. Now, some of them are turning around. I think India just announced a, a cut. Brazil had announced a cut. Yep. But I think that was part of it. I think part of it was like the Swiss National Bank wasn't as active as they were. And they're not big, but they stopped. Yep. And the UK Central Bank. And so, but I, I'm with you that anecdotal evidence didn't support the hard data that people were showing me. But this is why it's so dangerous, right? Yeah. Because you don't see it coming. Yeah. You're right, liquidity drives markets. If it's kind of evaporating underneath the surface, yeah. then you know, we're in real trouble. Well, what was interesting is I think global M1 growth peaked in August of last year and had fallen pretty dramatically through the first week of December, which makes sense when you yeah. look at stocks were falling too. And then since that first week of October, there's been this injection. And it reminds me very much of 2016. So the, the spoiler alert to my view is exactly what happened in 2016. So yeah, I, I marvel that, that people will comb through my old tweets or my old <laughs> letters to find the one thing that I said that was wrong. Yeah. Like, yeah, I was wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Yeah. I mean, I just hope to be right 51, 52, like the legends are right 58. I aspire to be more than 50. And my problem is it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, as you and I talk about it. It's how much you make when you're right and how much you lose when Correct. you're wrong. But the point is they, they, they throw this out and say, well, in 2015, you said this was going to happen. I said, well, it was happening. If you go back to 2015, PMI was collapsing. By first quarter of 2016, PMI was sub-50. That's contraction. We had the biggest drop in corporate earnings, I think, at that time in history because of the oil collapse. 
Now, granted, that was more industrial, but it was still, yeah. overall, the S&P earnings were, were collapsing. As I, I think maybe the, the, the great financial crisis was worse for the whole market, but that segment was really bad. Stock market was down 12% in six weeks, first six weeks of 2016. Oil is $26, mm-hmm. looked like it was going to zero. And then magically everything went up. Well, what happened? China put a trillion dollars yep. into the global economy. They bought oil futures, they bought iron ore futures, they bought, you know, S&B bought stocks and, you know, everybody bought stocks and we, so that happened. And so I changed my mind and I said, all right, now it looks like we're gonna really inflate this bubble. And I wrote a couple months later that now it looks like 1928, 29, and we're gonna have Hooverville type bubble, yep. you know, 2800. And I said, we hit 2800 in October 17, and then it would crash. And we hit 2870 or something in January of 18. I was only off by three months. And then it started down. And then remember February, so there was this big bounce again. What was that? Stealth QE. Stealth QE. The Fed's not allowed to buy stocks, but corporations are. Corporations are, yeah. So if, here's the deal, Mr. CEO, I will cut your corporate tax rate. Here's the deal. You are going to buy back stock. Mm-hmm. And that is stealth QE. And don't anybody tell you differently, that is what's going on. And that's how we've kept the market levitating for the last few months. And that started to go away, right? The data started to swamp the ability to buy back stock. And so now they're doubling down on that and saying, well, now everybody's got to buy back stock. And, and now it's turned into this political football where they want to outlaw it again. Now, I personally am in the camp that the pre-81 view was right, that it is insider trading. Yeah. That's just me. I don't want to get a big debate with everybody on that, but that, that is my view. I think it's used for stock price manipulation and enriching the management, but that's just me. But I do think it is a form of stealth QE since the Fed can't buy equities directly. You know, you touched on something there that, that I, I, w- I want to talk to you about because it's it's a it's a bugbear of mine. You know, this this idea that people are throwing brickbats at you for, for stuff that you said. Yeah, yeah. You know, th- this listening to you here, rationalize this, and put your best guess forward as to what's going on, right? Which is what we're all trying to do every day. At, at the end of the day. Every None day. of us know anything, right? We are all Nobody trying to guess knows about the future. Nothing. Nobody knows nothing. Nobody knows nothing. Right? So, so you know, when you, when you talk to the greatest investors of all time, talk to anyone around you now, Seth knows nothing. Yeah. Jeremy Grantham knows nothing. nothing. Kyle, Jeff Gundlach, none of these guys. Like, we don't know anything. Don't know anything. We're all trying to figure this out. What is it, do you think, that, that makes people so crazy about this stuff. When you come out and say, here's what I think's gonna happen. Yeah. And when it doesn't, people are like, you're an idiot. Well, I, didn't, I couldn't have known. This is a guess. I, here's the thing. I think part of it is social conditioning. You know, we're socially conditioned now with participation trophies and we're all great and everything's right. But this whole thing that, that you have to be right, no, you don't have to be right. And I think part of it too is look, I am, if you hadn't noticed, a hyperbolic personality. I tend to speak in hyperbole. I tend to, to live in hyperbole. I, you know, I, if you ask me my thought on the market, I'm gonna give you an answer. Now, that's my answer based on the information I have. Yep. And I don't have all the information. I have the information I can get, and I work pretty hard, and I get good information. I have good advisors, I have good friends, I have good people like you I talk to, so I feel pretty good. And our business, right, investing the business is about taking intelligent risks. Exactly right. If we take no risk, we get no return. So we have to take risks. And the only risk we can take are intelligent risks because we don't know the future. It's unknowable. So I can gather as much information as I can, and I can never gather it at all because I'm human, and then I'm gonna make a decision. And that's gonna be my decision. I'm gonna act on it. And I think the problem is so many people they're afraid to make a decision because they're afraid of being wrong mm-hmm. because they've been told they're right their whole life and they don't want everyone to be wrong. And I think second is, if you make a decision, well, now you could be held accountable for it. They don't like that right. because if you're wrong and someone tells you you're wrong, then you feel bad. I don't, I don't feel bad. If you and play basketball and you shoot a bad shot and then you think about it, what do you do? You go back and you make a mistake on defense and commit a foul. If you have instant erasure, don't even remember taking that shot. Now, you go back and you play good defense, steal the ball, make a layup. So the same thing in investing. 
if I obsessed about trying to be right every time, I would just crawl in a hole and go, because I'm wrong at least half the time, right. maybe more. Right. But because I don't care if I'm right or wrong, what I care about is, did I have a good process? Exactly. Did I have a good process? Did I come to a good decision? The outcome we're going to judge ex post. A priori, all I can do is focus on my decision, I mean, on my process, and making good decisions. I can't control the outcomes. Now, when I get the feedback, did I make a good decision? Or, well, I can actually objectively decide, did I make a good decision or a bad decision based on my process? Did I have a good outcome or a bad outcome? That's out of my control. Of course it is. And what I want, is. right, are good decisions with good outcomes. Sometimes I'm going to get good decisions with bad outcomes. And then I change my mind. New information comes along. It's like the famous Keynes quote, right? He gave a speech. Yep. Next week, gave the same speech, said something different. And the guy said, I was at your speech last week, and you said the exact opposite. Well, sir, when the information changes, I change my mind. What do you do? What do you do? Exactly. I, yes. And the other thing is, and this, this one really does bug me a little bit. People love this idea that if someone was wrong about something in the past, you can't trust their right. view today. Right. That's completely illogical. Yep. They're independent events. Now, if you evaluated why they were wrong and you said, oh, they have a crappy process, so I can't trust anything they say. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. Done. Right? Crappy process will lead to crappy outcomes. But if, if someone has a good process and has a pretty good track record of success and, and is right more than they're wrong and, and tends to risk mitigate when they're wrong, then this decision you have to evaluate in real time. At the end of the day, and and maybe it'll be the title of my new letters. Nobody knows nothing. No. I don't profess to know. I can't know, especially about the future. But what I never want to be is the person who doesn't act because they're afraid of being wrong. Well, yeah, the, look, the thing you risk by, by jumping on every time someone gets wrong is you make people unwilling to share their views. And at the end <laughs> of the day, what, yeah. what we want, we yeah. want as much information as we can. And you can yeah. decide if someone's, to your point, their process is no good and yeah. discount them. But you know, for investors, how do, they, how do they manage that ex post process of being wrong? And you go, yep. okay, I've, I've put everything into this. Yep. I was absolutely convinced X was going to happen. Yep. It hasn't. Yep. How do you then go through the process of admitting you're wrong, yep. which is a hard thing for all of us to do. You, know, you don't yep. want to wait a little bit longer in case I'm right, because I was so convinced. How do you go through that process and, and what do you do? You just recheck your facts if, you're, if you still believe it, you cut the position a little bit. How do you handle that? Dean Smith has this great uh, line. Duke and UNC in the same uh, conversation. Same How about conversation. that? I, I, you know, all, all my Carolina friends will be happy. Yeah, exactly. Keep it about, nice and even, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, Dean Smith has this great, Ralph, right? Recognize, admit, learn, forget. And so you have to recognize that you made a mistake, right? You have to admit that you made a mistake. You have to learn from it, and you have to forget about it. And so the process, again, dominates the outcome. Is good example. March 9th, 2009. We're in our Monday morning meeting, and uh, we had three weeks before assigned four teams to take four potential outcomes of what was going on mm -hmm. in the world, right? Markets were heading straight down. So one team was all the way down, down like forever. Great Depression, yep. down forever. One was stop going down, but don't get better. One was gets incrementally better. And one was we're wrong, it's a recovery. And a long, long story short, uh, we all gave our presentations and, and clearly we all had a bias because we had been short yeah. in size in 07 and 08 and made a lot of money for our clients. I mean, a lot. And so we were definitely biased. But the team that did the recovery was so compelling that we all kind of went, huh. And literally, while we're having the meeting, President Obama says, you know, I really think this is a good time to buy stocks. And what did we do? We ignored them both. Yeah. And we blew it. Yeah. And so we didn't get, um, because it was the best presentation of the four, by far, but we had our bias. Obama basically told you, I just fixed it, <laughs> y'all, right. Yeah. right? So let's go buy some stocks. 
but we didn't do it. So what we do? You know, a year later, we looked back and said, yeah, I messed that one up. So we went back and we went through this analysis and said, geez, David had the answer. Yeah. And we just didn't see it. And so we analyzed our process. And we said, we had a great process. We actually, in advance, did these debates, called them theme debates. We actually got good information on both the pro and the con. We had real-time good information, but we ignored it. So we let our biases get in the way. And so that was a learning experience. And so I like to say all the time that I clearly underestimated the impact of QE. I didn't get it. Yeah. I didn't know David Zervos then. I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand the power of it. You know, all I remembered was what I had read from Ray Dalio's work from the 1930s experience where it really didn't work out that well. But I forgot it actually did work. In 30 and 31, it worked pretty well. Failed in 37, but I didn't get that deep. Mm -hmm. And so it's a long answer to your really good question, which is we analyze the mistake, learn from it, and then forget it. And then try to do better the next time. So we still do our theme debates. And we try not to be quite as dismissive of things that we disagree with. And, and something that I, I think is, is really, really important to investing, and I talk about this all the time, probably ad nauseum to people, is the reason our business is harder today is because of the echo chamber we all live in. Yeah. So because our life is dominated by what we like on social media, we're served up only information that supports what we believe. And we actually not only don't hear the opposite, we get inverse stories sent to us that make the opposing look bad. Yeah. So a great investor today now has to go further and seek alternative views. Right? You have to seek out, if you're a bear, you gotta find a bull and you gotta sit down and you gotta tell me why I'm wrong. If you're a bull, you gotta find a bear. And, and I think that's hard for people. Because there's a cognitive dissonance. Is why would I want to talk to somebody? They're stupid. Well, <laughs> they, and, they don't believe and, what I believe. Well, and today, everywhere you look, the two sides are so far apart, right? Yeah. So you try and have a rational conversation, bull to bear, about anything. The two sides speak different languages. Yes. And so you, you, there's an inability to sit down and talk about anything, whether it's Tesla or politics. That, or, that's a really important point. Such an important point. That people who are on opposite sides of any issue today, because of this polarization we live in, can't talk civilly right and you, you and i were talking about this the other day about twitter is one of the best pieces of advice i got when i came on was block early and often and you said yeah. well i don't block and I'm like well i only block for lack of civility yeah right? you want to disagree with me bring it i want to talk yep. to you right but if you call me names or you you tell me i'm stupid no i have no time for that and that's the problem is just because someone believes something different than you doesn't make you stupid or them stupid it makes you both have something that you should exchange exactly right a big piece of this is um, when we think about what makes great investors great, it's one, the ability to do good work and have a good process. Two, it's ability to not um, get caught in the, the, the vicious cycle of being dragged down if you make a mistake or do something wrong or lose money. Uh, and there's the other thing, what's the best loss, the first loss, mm -hmm. you know, don't let it, don't, don't say I'm right, the market's wrong, just, just get out, move on, you got other ideas. And so there are all these things that, that the great investors do that make them great, and I think a big piece of it has to do with combating the environment in which you're in, and I use that word intentionally, because it is like battle now. Yeah. Because you got, you got more competition, um, you got more tools, you know, the, the, the combatants are more heavily armed. And I think computers make people smarter and they're faster and things happen. And one thing that I've been actually thinking a lot about, you got, we started this whole conversation about how's the business changing. The idea that a human being could create an organization that would do real substantive fundamental work and gain an edge? I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm worried about that. I think, um, you know, how do you compete with satellite imagery that's processed in real time? Sure. How do you compete with high frequency traders that are scalping pennies on milliseconds? 
how do you compete with people who, who get the first call from the Treasury Secretary and you don't? Um, I don't know. I'll answer that question for you. Okay. Value. Value. Ah, that's, well, that's you how go. you compete. And, and, right? and, and you are 100% right. And that is exactly why, that's where I always migrate to. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's exactly where you migrate to because it's the only place you can get an edge. If you do the work and you buy assets that are below fundamental intrinsic value, you will eventually win. Yeah. Not tomorrow, but eventually you win. And that's, that's why you're the smartest guy ever. <laughs> well, listen, I can't let you go without one more question, and that's the dollar, because this is something that yeah. you know, you, you've been very vocal. Yes. Uh, and I just want to see if your opinions change, if your time horizons change, because it's kind of been whipping around. And we had a great debate on Real Vision between Luke and, and Brent recently. I know, you guys moderated. left me out. You know, the three of us <laughs> did right. the uh, original It was a really small table. No, it was no, no. a really small no, no, no. table. It's, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but, you know, we did the original five part, five hours. Yeah. Five hours we debated the dollar uh, 18 months ago. And, and look, my, my fundamental view has not changed at all, but it goes back to that time horizon thing, which yeah. is I think the dollar is in secular decline. I think we are in a race to the bottom with the yen and the euro. And I think all developed markets have no choice. They got bad demographics, they got too much debt, and they have deflation, persistent, pernicious deflation. So the killer Ds, as I call mm -hmm. them. And the only way out of that is currency devaluation. Now, what I, what I missed last year was two years ago, we were the lone voice yeah. saying the dollar was going down. And, and we got it. And I went back and I, I, I go through my 10 surprises and I go back and I review them. How did I do last year? How did, and what I remember, and I actually put it in, in my presentation, I said the spoiler for the dollar last year, which I, I thought it would continue to go down, is secular decline. The spoiler was that a year ago in 2017, everyone was long. By 2018, net short. Yeah. And that was a problem. So there were too many people net short. And what I didn't see, again, can't know everything. I did not see the trade war coming. Yep. And the dollar actually did weaken from January 1st to April 12th. So my, my view was actually looking good, but to that point of you have to change your mind when the facts change, as soon as he announced that trade war, it was clear that there was going to be a flight to the dollar. Now, the dollar didn't go crazy. Nope. Yeah. You know, it went from 88 to 96 or 97, and now it looks like it's making another rounding top. So I'm still in the bear camp. I still give props to the guys who believe there could be a dollar squeeze mm -hmm. and one last, you know, cathartic move up before the collapse. I actually don't think it's going to happen. What I actually believe happened is every 18 months or so, one of the big three has to take the baton. Yeah. And they have to take their medicine and they have to weaken their currency. I mean, strengthen their currency. And the euro did it 18 months ago. They went three months too long. And now they're suffering because they're going to have a bad recession. Mm -hmm. But when, when the euro got to 127, yeah. something yeah. like that, that was bad for Germany, bad for France. And so they passed the baton quickly. And the yen took a little run and, and got strong January to April. And uh, Japanese stock market went down. And then we took it and we went from April to October. September, October, yeah. And I think now we've passed it back to Japan. You know, yen got strong, their market went down. So I don't know who's going to get it next. Actually, what I think is going to happen is I think China's going to take it. And I think the Chinese currency is going to strengthen. Kyle and everybody else thinks it's going to weaken. I think Chinese currency is going to strengthen. I think they're going to try one last Shanghai Accord 2.0 to save the world. But I think the cover is bare, and I think we're going to have this slow, steady decline. And well, value is you, what it's all about. Yeah, right. Well, look, you, it's all about you, value. You, you call it a baton. I, I think of it more as a hot potato, but I think yeah, I think you're, I think you're hot potatoes right. is better well, description. Look, you know, as always, it's it's so much fun, and I wish we could sit here all night and continue this conversation, but Me we too. can't. We run out of time. Um, awesome. Next time, perhaps we'll get together and talk Fortnite. You and I. Ah, that'd be awesome. Who wouldn't want to watch that? Two fifty-five-year-old ah. guys were talking about Fortnite. If we get up and floss right now, how would that be? No, not Listen, good. I'm not even sure what that is, but I don't like the sound of it. But yeah. as always, <laughs> great fun. And let's do it again soon. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks.